I would like to um, invite the first session chair of the first session, Emerging Approaches in Nano Risk um, Assessment, who is Professor Peter Hoyt from the uh, Catholic University in Leuven, Belgium, um, to introduce uh, yeah, new developments in human hazard assessment, focus on IOPs, QSARS, and IATA. Okay, thank you. Um, so can you please show, yeah, thank you, my slides. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to lead a short session in, in this uh, educational uh, day, uh, the first hour. And the title, what I got here is, is yeah, uh, a bit many abbreviations why what and how and then uh, various emerging approaches iata nams aops and qsaw so, so uh, it's i think this needs somewhat more explanation uh, um, so first maybe the what uh, so so what are all these abbreviations and i tried to yeah find the short uh, the short de definitions of of all these abbreviations uh, on European and or uh, AOCD uh, websites. And so IATA is a uh, integrated assessment of uh, testing approaches. So this means that it is a kind of flexible approach in chemical safety assessment uh, where um, people try to integrate um, and translate uh, data from multiple sources uh, uh, and, and multiple methods. Uh, so it's a broad uh, way of, of assessing the safety. And then um, the second one, the NAMS, is, is relatively similar, uh, but here is clearly indicated that it is a non-animal based approach uh, where, uh, again, broad as possible information in the context of safety uh, chemical safety hazard and safety and, and, and risk assessment is brought together but also techniques are used or introduced like uh, read across uh, screening prioritization and so on and then we have two uh, other uh, abbreviations in, in this listing of, of the title, the AOPs, which are the adverse outcome pathways. In this, uh, models are built uh, in which we try to, to find, um, based on the molecular interaction at first step of, of the, uh, the chemical used or the material used. Uh, this is nano safety. So we are talking mainly about uh, nanoparticles in this, this meeting. Uh, and we go from molecular events to cellular events up to uh, full animal uh, events. So, so it's really a pathway eh, of different outcomes. Eh, and at the end, we see an in vivo adverse outcome. And, and so we build a pathway from molecular event to that outcome. And then Another model, right? it's a more mathematical based model or models, eh, which these are the QSARs or the SARS. Eh? So Q stands for quantitative and then SAR is structure activity relationship. And so here, um, based purely on the chemical structure eh, and certainly with aid of data, which is uh, available already on, on hazard and a risk of a certain compound. Uh, models are built, mathematical models are built to predict by logical fate of a certain compound. So this is more or less the what, and it also includes already a little bit the how. And so why do we do this uh, different approaches? So, um, Clearly, uh, I think the first uh, issue the here is we try to get a good view on the hazard of material. Right? So, so the biological, toxicological 
effects uh, it's in fact in all the four uh, approaches so it is mainly test data driven when we look to IATA and NAMS uh, and it's more specific for the AOPs uh, it's key events molecular events and initially these models are built for one specific compound with a certain adverse outcome uh, but we see also see that people try to make it uh, AOPs for more gene generic context. And the same a bit for the Q source or the SARS, eh, which, which is chemical where the chemical characteristics are very important of a compound and then uh, biological effects are looked at and modeled uh, in these mathematical models. Right? And so, and also here eh, in, in this Q source, very specific to sometimes if possible to a broader context and uh, another why is that uh, in all the testing uh, strategies uh, we internationally try to reduce the use of animals the three r's are important and this is clearly indicated in in the nuts eh? but in fact in all the strategies uh, shown here so more in vitro in silico in chemical but no animal approaches. And then um, clearly also these uh, methods are there to support the risk assessment, the one a bit more than the other, but as Cole, certainly all of them have supporting in, in risk assessment. And they are all have the purpose that we get a better mechanistic understanding of the chemical interaction, particle interaction with tissues, with cells towards an adverse outcome, eh? and that we use less animals and get a better safety, human safety, environmental safety. So that is a bit the why, what, and also how uh, this has been approached. Um, just before I present or, or I invite the first speaker, I also want to point out that um, you can find more on this type of approaches tomorrow in room three. Eh? There are two talks on adverse outcome pathways. And in room four, uh, a bit overlapping, I'm afraid. Um, also there, a lot of talks on risk assessment approaches and, and adverse outcome pathways. So then the how, eh? that's not me that's going to present this. It's going to be presented by uh, three different speakers. Um, Dario Greco, uh, Penny Nijmark, and uh, Marvin uh, Martens. But I first invite here uh, Dario Greco, who is going to talk about beyond chemical centric models from toxical genomics to integrated approaches for IATA developments. So please, Dario. Okay, hello everybody. I hope you can hear me and uh, by all means probably also see my ugly face. Uh, nice nice to virtually see you all. It's a sad time, but that's what we get nowadays. Um, well, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here and thanks Peter for the uh, introduction. So yes, as, as uh, Peter was telling, I will uh, give you a very brief overview on some of the projects we are doing in my lab in, uh, in, in Finland, uh, where we are trying to integrate uh, uh, toxicogenomics approaches uh, to chemocentric models in order to uh, hopefully gain a better insight uh, into the, uh, not only the, 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 the safety assessment of nanomaterials, but also uh, eventually uh, in the future, the uh, safe by design driven by this kind of uh, reasoning. Now it's it's clear that uh, that uh, toxicology is uh, drifting from uh, describing purely describing um, um, uh, phenotypic events to a more sophisticated description of the mechanisms by which an exposure might uh, eventually interact with the biological system and cause a certain uh, outcome of interest. Now, when we look at this in, in the perspective of um, 
uh, of uh, um, uh, designing new uh, chemicals, um, it's, it's obvious that traditional uh, chemocentric approaches where we look uh, um, exclusively at the intrinsic uh, properties of the exposure uh, give only um, a limited amount of control over the system for the fact that essentially they are neglecting the, uh, the study of the, of the uh, biological interactions uh, at the molecular level. And what we also believe is that uh, hopefully um, uh, an integrated approach where we consider along with the uh, chemocentric um, uh, properties of the exposure, also the biocentric properties of the exposure, that hopefully we can uh, gain uh, better uh, insights also uh, in terms of uh, designing uh, new chemicals. So in the first example here, I will discuss on, on some of the studies we've been doing, we are doing uh, for uh, trying to understand how much in vitro models can really um, uh, help us to inform of aspects that uh, otherwise, we would uh, need in vivo uh, models to investigate. So in this um, uh, bit older study that we published already a few years ago, um, I, uh, so basically we, <clears throat> we compared an in vivo mouse lung model with an in vitro model of uh, human macrophages, both at the transcriptomic and phenotypic level, uh, after exposure to uh, six different carbon nanomaterials. And uh, so basically here, the assumption is that when, if we look at the, at the transcriptome uh, and, and we look at the, at the ensemble of all the genes that are altered upon uh, a certain exposure, we would uh, define this set of molecules as the mechanism of action of of in this specific case of the nanomaterial. And our uh, goal here is uh, to further model this data in order to dissect specific trajectories of, um, uh, of specific genes and molecules that respond to uh, some, maybe a combination of intrinsic properties of the, of the uh, exposure. Uh, so interestingly, when we approached the modeling of this data by a, so to say, a traditional univariate approach where you traditionally from toxicogenomics data would analyze one gene at a time or one molecule at a time, we couldn't find striking similarities between in vivo and in vitro systems. As here you can see the gray area in this pie chart um, uh, signifying the number of genes that are non -common, uh, commonly altered by, um, uh, by the in vitro and in vivo. At the same time, when on the same data, we applied a systems biology, uh, so to say borrowed approach based on the uh, inference of, of uh, molecular networks, then we could indeed find um, a significantly large proportion of the mechanism of action of, of these nanomaterials that would um, uh, coincide between uh, in vivo and in vitro. Uh, now, a follow-up study on this was uh, quite quite nicely conducted by Pia Kinneret in my group and recently published uh, in the beginning of this year, uh, where basically we extended the, the, the study of uh, human macrophages in vitro uh, to, um, um, to, to the investigation of a number of, of, uh, of molecular districts in the macrophages in response to carbon nanotubes. And we ended up with an integrated model where basically uh, we postulate that it's, uh, it's, um, it's a combination of the rigidity and the aspect ratio of the carbon nanotubes that would eventually govern the, the, the polarization response of, of human macrophages either towards uh, M1, so pro-inflammatory, or otherwise M2 um, uh, regulatory um, uh, phenotype in, in macrophages. So in this second example, um, instead I would like to discuss how we are using toxicogenomics and integrated modeling to, to go beyond toxicity endpoints and trying to link directly uh, the exposure with um, with human uh, diseases directly. So in this in this um, uh, study published last year, um, we collected a significant amount of biosignatures of 
a number of nanomaterials as well as drugs, uh, chemicals, and diseases. And we um, uh, derived models that would basically suggest that um, uh, metal and metal oxide nanoparticles have strong similarities in, the, in their mechanism of action as um, uh, the alterations that uh, molecular alterations that you will observe in the major uh, neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and ALS. Um, and by looking at by using the biomarkers that we derived from these um, from these predictions, we also set up a large panel of biochemical assay in vivo in a, in a, in a whole body um, uh, exposure uh, in zebrafish. And uh, we eventually could reconstruct AOPs uh, for these specific nano nanomaterials that would either affect the, the, the central nervous tissues directly acting on the neurons or indirectly acting through the um, uh, interaction with glial cells. And uh, AOPs obviously are extremely central in, in, uh, in development of, of uh, uh, alternative metals, but also in the development of IATA, uh, and 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 Penny after me will uh, will uh, certainly get uh, into this more in details. I just wanted to touch upon this and tell a small exercise we have done this year. Um, uh, we're basically looking at the AOP. Um, we basically compared the AOP from um, known uh, to be uh, to take to take place during the. Uh, um, a, um, lung fibrosis uh, after uh, certain nanomaterials um, exposure into the lung, and the um, and the COVID nineteen um, uh, key events in um, in acute uh, response. And what we we found is that based on on the analysis of the key events in these two AOPs, we could um, um, uh, build a model where we basically uh, put an additional line here suggesting that a long-term effect of COVID-19 could indeed uh, be lung fibrosis. And unfortunately, uh, the more we get into this pan uh, current pandemic, the more clinical data we uh, collect, we actually are um, unfortunately observing lung fibrosis indeed in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, with elder patients. All right, um, the last very few minutes, uh, this is going to be really short, is um, um, are going to be devoted to the description of the modeling data that uh, or the modeling efforts that we have done uh, in the context of the nano solutions uh, project, where basically we try to understand if we could gain more information when we go from a traditional QSAR approach where the toxicity effects are, fun are, are modeled as a function of the intrinsic properties of the exposure to a new integrated um, uh, modeling approach where the toxicity endpoints are instead um, um, uh, modeled as a function of both the intrinsic properties together with a uh, mode of action uh, derived from, from um, uh, toxicogenomics approaches. So in nanosolutions, we studied 31 nanomaterials of industrial interest and the whole consortium worked really hard for five years to uh, collect an enormous amount of information on these nanomaterials, not only on their intrinsic properties by fully characterizing them, but also uh, the, uh, the, the biological effects that these 31 materials was, were exerting both in vitro and in vivo and in a number of biological systems, as well as collecting in, uh, in a multi-omics very much in-depth information on the mechanism of action. Well, long story short, our uh, analysis clearly suggests that uh, models that are comprising um, uh, multiple uh, data layers, so you can see here, uh, mRNA, microRNA, proteomics, intrinsic properties. So these models are clearly performing better in terms of um, prediction of toxicity uh, as compared to the uh, uh, approaches and uh, you can see an overview here. Last slide and uh, sorry for being uh, late. Uh, yeah. Just um, uh, just to remind us how data is. So in the context of the NanoSolve IT project, 
uh, we have collected basically all available uh, toxicogenomic data for human mouth and rats uh, after nanomaterial exposure. And we found that a significant share of these either are not fair enough to be reused or they have some serious problems in the design. So just to say that good modeling is actually uh, de fully dependent on, on the data. So the summary, um, um, we, we find that the molecular network inference can actually help the transition between in vitro and in vitro. When we contextualize the mechanism of action, we can actually go beyond specific endpoints towards human other therapies. And finally, the hybrid uh, modeling approaches simply uh, Okay, yeah, we need to yes. Yes. to to stop it now. Sorry to to it interrupt stopped. you, but uh, yeah, 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 I, yeah. So so certainly you have to thank your collaborators. I understand also, uh, but people can see them. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, just one question. Yeah, you you showed a lot of of uh, data on on on. Um, in vitro testing, for instance, and then uh, you have a lot of uh, toxicogenomic data. But is there not a danger that uh, looking too much to in vitro short time exposures that you miss uh, what is really happening uh, also in the gene tox, uh, genomic uh, data, uh, what is really happening in, on long term exposures? Yeah, definitely, absolutely. This is a this is a very crucial point, uh, and and uh, so our our uh, approach towards uh, going beyond this limit, this obvious limitation, is to look at other districts of the molecular alterations in in biological systems. We uh, we have proof now that uh, epigenomics and epigenetic alterations are actually. Uh, very informative in terms of possible long-term effects of an exposure, even when you uh, look at uh, relatively short time points uh, in vitro. So, so uh, my personal understanding is that we should move more and more towards uh, multi-omics approaches, especially looking at uh, epigenomic um, uh, alterations. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that. Um... Thank you. Yeah. I cannot uh, let any other question in, but I didn't see anything appear in the chat also from, from questions from the audience. So please, audience, if you have a question, try to type it into the chat uh, and then uh, we can pick it up during uh, the discussion. So I, I'm, yeah, we have a very tight time schedule as I, I notice now. So now uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Penny Nymark from Kalinsky Institute to give her presentation. Please, uh, Penny. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, so thanks to the organizers for um, inviting me here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about adverse outcome pathways and data integration within nano safety. So I'm Penny Nymark from, um, uh, I'm an assistant professor at the Institute of Environmental Medicine at Karolinska Institute here in Sweden. And um, so I'm going to start, let me see if I can change slides. That's the way to go. Okay, so um, just a brief, I don't know, many of you might know all about, and you heard a little bit about adverse outcome path pathways already, but just to set the scene for my talk, I want to take you through the definition of an AOP. So an adverse outcome pathway is really a conceptual framework that portrays existing knowledge and that's central to what I'm gonna be talking about, uh, concerning biologically plausible key events and causally linked molecular initiating events to an adverse outcome. And um, these two latter uh, bold um, terms, biologically plausible and causality, is also very central to the AOP concept being so um, or believed to take us beyond 21st or into 21st century toxic toxicity testing. So now data integration is of course very central to the AOP concept, especially since it's building on existing knowledge. And the AOPs really represent this continuum of development that we see within research. So 
uh, it really um, represents this. So AOPs are never really uh, finished. They continue to develop as we gain more existing, more available knowledge and understanding. And so AOPs can be uh, developed at different stages of maturity. They can be putative uh, at the very start where, I don't know, do you see my uh, pointer now? Can someone maybe confirm? I'm losing time, but <laughs> anyway, I'm hoping you see it. Um, it's the third button from the left and you can select, for example, the pencil. Oh, right, I'm, I missed that point. There is a uh, private point and an official point. Okay, maybe there, here. Okay, now I think I have it. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so AOPs uh, can be putative, they can be formal uh, or qual qualitative, and they can be quantitative. But having said that, they are never finished. They are always um, under development as existing knowledge increases. Now, when it comes to it seems to be that our presenter is gone from the system. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know if it's my internet or I, I lost the presenters, right? So, okay, but uh, going back to AOP applications. So uh, a, a specific uh, AOP's application is, is dependent on a case by case uh, determination of its fit for purpose. And that can depend on the level of de development. So early stage, uh, less mature AOPs are applicable at early stage risk assessment approaches or pre-regulatory risk assessment approaches, while the more mature AOPs are more applicable to YATAs, so integrated approaches to testing and assessment and more close to regulatory application. Now, um, going into uh, nano AOPs within nano safety. So uh, AOPs are stressor agnostic, and this is one of the most central principles of the AOP fram framework. They are always um, applicable to any stressor that uh, initiates the molecular initiating event. That having been said, uh, specific model stressors can still be used to develop AOPs. And that means that within the AOP or within nano safety, using uh, data from the nano safety realm is uh, applicable as model stressor data, which can then be used to develop AOPs, which naturally then become applicable to nano safety also. So this is a set of six uh, AOPs that were developed in jointly between the two projects, Patrols and Smart Nano Talks. And, um, and where you can see really um, MIEs that are very, specific to nanomaterials, but do go beyond that if there would be a stressor that acts in similar modes of action as uh, nanomaterials. So these are uh, stressor agnostic, but, but applicable to nanomaterials and describe a set of lung injuries that are central uh, to nano safety and relevant to nanomaterials. So, um, but building on that, and this is something that Marvin will be talking more about after me. So not only is uh, nanomaterial data relevant to building AOPs applicable to nano safety, 
but also thinking going back to the fact that we build on existing data um, linkage with existing life science knowledge is equally important and bringing in all that knowledge that has been gathered over decades of research from different types of uh, fields is equally uh, relevant to AOP development. So this is just briefly showing you how AOP Wiki, the, the central re repository for AOPs, is um, Marvin has linked it here to genes and pathways in the Wiki Pathway database, which means that you can then start enriching AOPs with molecular detail, pathway detail, and genes and, and links between genes and enabling then AOP coupled transcriptomics analysis. And this is something that, that um, is believed to really enrich the AOPs. Now, um, building on this uh, concept and this work, uh, we have also been working on a process, a, a so-called data fusion pipeline that builds um, or generates basically interactive bioinformatically useful AOP uh, linked molecular pathways. Now these pathways are expected to both uh, inform on central key biological processes and molecular players uh, involved in adverse outcomes. So really identifying biomarkers for key events and in addition, enabling broad development of broad coverage, high throughput and high content assays, in vitro assays that are able to detect these key uh, molecular players. And then allowing for a wide variety of AOP linked uh, data analysis during risk assessment. And for example, looking at AOP linked gene set analysis uh, gives you uh, an indication that that you're you're looking at bioinformatically and statistically tested uh, perturbation of uh, AOP link gene sets, giving you an indication that there's something going on in the in that specific AOP. And remember that these AOPs have the the inherent understanding of causality which really gives you a robust um, risk assessment. So, um, and then building further, so when it comes to AOP applicability, so this is a picture um, showing that we published a few, or in the beginning of this year, basically, showing the process of um, uh, basically safe by design. So in nano safety, of course, we've been working a lot. There's been big efforts towards uh, looking at early stage um, risk assessment in the innovation process. So when you're developing nanotechnologies, you look at risk assessment already early during the very early phases of product development. Now, um, in this uh, effort, we then linked uh, new approaches, so NOMs, to these different stages and looked across different types of methods and how they fit in uh, to this process of pre-regulatory risk assessment, basically. In addition, we were looking at these uh, existing human risk assessment models that could accept information from new approach methodologies. Now, what you see is that AOPs really cover all these stages because they are so central for the data integration. So all of these previous methods here generate or they take into consideration existing data uh, and they also generate new data later in the stage gate process, so the innovation process. And what that means is that the AOPs come in and can support the systematic and structured organization of all this data. So, and this was this is really coupled to the application of data or of AOPs and supported by data integration. 
Now, something that we're still uh, figuring out is how to scale and score data for these dis different purposes. Okay, so going very fast to the last slide, I'm almost finished. Um, of course, uh, existing data needs to be available and there's huge efforts going into making data fair and really allowing uh, it to become findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And this is just a brief uh, mention of the nano safety data interface, which combines a lot of data from different projects. The nano reg two data is about to become public. Not sure it's not yet, but I think it should be soon. And in addition, we have a public omics metadata instance um, in this uh, in this context. In addition, there's the new FAIR implementation network for nano safety, the advanced nano av uh, available to where you can look closer at the efforts going on and where you can join a community of uh, verifying nano safety data. So thank you, that was it for me. I have the acknowledgement slide and that's it. And so uh, Marvin has, um, is uh, going to come on after me, and he has some questions that we have put up together to um, ask you, basically, to make this a little bit interactive. And I'm guessing Marvin is going to have access now after me. Thank okay. you. Yeah. For that. Thank, thank you, uh, Penny. Um, I did not see any question appearing in the chat, or my chat is not uh, working. So please, people, where you have any remark question uh, noted down I, I've got one uh, small um, question about AOPs and, and and it's very useful in in, in hazard assessment and so on but um, is there also any effort going on uh, how to link in those levels into AOPs because you have yeah hazard but but only hazard is not uh, helping us to to go to safety evaluations. Yes, so that's a great question. And in fact, so of course you're very right, exposure is not part of the AOP, yeah. but exposure comes in very uh, early before you get into this. And we are uh, attempting to connect these two. And the last, or the next last figure that I showed the uh, safe by design slide actually has some uh, indications of that, of how we bring in exposure data to um, inform on the doses and the, the point of departure for these hazard assessment um, uh, approaches and in connection to AOPs. So this is really something that, uh, yeah, and especially within nano, nano safety, I think this is, I mean, of course it's important also for chemicals, but we do see uh, challenges with this because of the nano uh, material dosimetry issues that we're yeah, still yeah. facing. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I have to interrupt you because yeah, time is just too short. Uh, yes. It's yeah. very short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A very okay. first question was posed by Fleming Cassie in the chat box to me. While we are still seeing our um, our survey running, um, how about uh, species difference in AOPs, Penny? Yes, that's also a very interesting question. So at the moment, we are focusing a lot on humans, but as you um, so, AOPs come with an interesting principle, both the fact that they are um, stressor agnostic. So you can bring in data and information from other fields regarding uh, or other types of stressors, but not only, you can also go across species. So when it comes to um, the AOPs themselves, they're built out of modules so each key event and each molecular initiating event and each AO is actually a, a module which can be isolated from its original AOP <coughs> and um, brought into describing and looking at um, 
species across species effects. So very conserved key events that do go across different species can be also refined to reflect these yeah. cross species effects. Yeah, so, so sorry, Penny, but yeah, I really I have long uh, answers. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, thank you very much, Penny, for, for this in very interesting talk. And so now I uh, like to introduce um, Marvin to the stage. Uh, so he's going to give us showcasing the AOP wiki resources description framework, uh, why AOPs or nano AOPs do not exist. So please, Marvin. Um, Yes, thank you very much, Peter. Um, in the meanwhile, I already started up the um, the questions that Penny submitted to me to to ask to the viewers here. Um, I guess most people have already been filling them in. I see the the questions filling in quite nicely here. You can all see the share screen, right? If I'm correct, I see quite some some variety of questions in. But oxidative stress seems to be the the highest number of. of entries here in this uh, in this question of, of key events related to nanomaterials. I will quickly go to the last question of Penny that she had to the audience. If you want to comment, Penny, you can still. No, that's fine. It looks really, I'm ha super happy to see so many answers here. I wasn't sure what to expect if people would actually have ideas on this, but great. Um, so yeah, I will start my presentation in, in one minute. Um, I'll present mostly about the AOP Wiki as was already shortly introduced by Penny uh, just a minute ago, um, which uh, I transformed into a resource description framework, RDF, to make more easy access and interoperability of the database with other resources and other data. Um, yeah, I think I will just go go into it right now, not to spend time on. Um, ah, OK, yes, perfect. Um, stop sharing screen, I guess. OK, so um, thank you for joining. Thank you for asking me to present this. Um, like I said, I will present about the AOP Wiki, so I skipped the whole introduction of Adverse Outcome Pathways since it was already introduced twice now. Um, thank you for that, by the way, Peter and, and Penny. Um, so the AOP Wiki, as said, is the central repository for Adverse Outcome Pathways. It's mostly containing on uh, descriptive uh, text of mechanisms of action, basically the, the uh, description of uh, the collection of literature that describes uh, the molecular processes that occur upon uh, exposure to a stressor. And this is structured in these key events and key event relationships, of which there are over a thousand in the AOP Wiki, uh, building over 300 adverse outcome pathways. So it's a quite uh, extensive um, path already, uh, quite extensive database already. But it's growing very fast with many initiatives, trying to develop more and more efficient and more um, generic adverse outcome pathways to make them applicable to not only chemicals, which is in this moment the majority, but also to nanomaterials with other kinds of stresses as well. Um, so just like Penny, I also had some questions in the um, in the uh, um, presentation in WooClub. Um, I already set this email or this email, this URL in the bar in the uh, in the text box. So most people already, I see already 70 people joined in that, that URL. Um, and I was just curious how many people already had seen at any moment the AOP Wiki. Do you know it? Have you ever searched for information inside of it? And I see, I guess, wait, let me just share again. Oh, share. Um, my fault. So I see the, the majority has never seen the AOP Wiki. Um, but also quite a lot of people, 28%, has seen it at some point. As some people never heard of the AOP Wiki. No, now you have. Um, this is the AOP Wiki, but what I'm going to show now is basically a transformed version of the AOP Wiki. 
then this maybe relates, this is not a question, maybe relates to the one that already was asked by Penny, but what kind of things would you look for in an adverse outcome pathway wiki? What kind of um, things would you try to enter in this database to find information about your nanomaterial or your uh, process of interest related to nanomaterials? Um, chemical name, cast number, I see nanomaterial. Interesting, mostly mostly on the stressor related, not so much on the adverse outcome specific. Cellular fates. I, 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 I'm storing all of these answers because I, these are very interesting answers. So I'm very happy that you are all so actively filling these in. Um, going back at the presentation. Somehow it switches um, back to the, the main presentation every time. I'm, I'm probably doing that wrong. Yes, thank you. Um, so basically we build the adverse outcome pathway wiki uh, resource description framework to increase, to improve its interoperability with other databases, add more identifiers for both chemicals and genes and allow uh, interoperability and, and accessibility increase by services by tools and also by using metadata and specific uh, uh, topic specific ontologies to make the, the vocabulary used in this database more more consistent and more widely used so there's a few there's a few ways to use the aop wiki rdf uh, one of them is the regular sparkle endpoint uh, which is um, a place where you can use Sparkle Query, which is a, a query language to extract data from resource description framework data, um, which I will just show very briefly in a minute. Um, another example that I will show is an API built on top of uh, Sparkle Endpoint with using GitHub, a code repository. And um, this also allows you to use AOP wiki content or query and extract AOP wiki content using coding environments such as Jupyter Notebooks. And finally, I will briefly show a screenshot of recent developments on a Sparkle Explorer interface that we've been working on. So very roughly said, if you know that AOP wiki um, currently has very limited options of exploring the data, um, this RDF allows you to basically enter any type of question that you want as long as you know a little bit of the, the sparkle query language um or know how to use one of the uh, or adapt the questions that we already made and um this allows you to extract for example in this case uh, all key events all aops and all um information that is related to fibrosis. I was expecting one of the adverse outcomes to be fibrosis since that was one of the main focuses of, of Penny's work earlier. Um, and this is just a screenshot of what comes out of a query like this, where you um, search for any key event or any adverse outcome that has the word fibrosis and then gets you the data back. Um, well, I have only a few minutes left. <clears throat> Like I said, the, um, the garlic interface, this is a, a, a application programming interface built on top of a uh, GitHub repository with preloaded Sparkle queries. So there you don't have to know the Sparkle query language, but you can directly uh, enter your variables or enter your, <clears throat> enter your uh, um, uh, call basically and get the results back in the very same way. You can do this in various formats. And also this is, um, usable through command line or through coding environments as well, which is what I show very briefly here. This is the example of how to use both of them. So on the left side, the AOP wiki RDF, the Sparkle endpoint, and on the right side, the uh, garlic UI. And um, this is just very simple examples, but this is the same question that I had before where I want to know all of the key events that have the word fibrosis in the title. Uh, basically looking at all the adverse outcomes that are part of that. And then the question on the right side, the, the, the bunch of code on the right side, is basically extracting the AOPs of which these um, um, uh, adverse outcomes are a part. In this case, only the first one is shown. And you can do a lot of nice of modeling with this kind of uh, approaches where you can really quickly generate 
AOP networks or AOP um, information. You can you can model it in any way uh, um, how you like, and this is very very efficient and very fast, and, and it saves you a lot of time looking through many many pages in the AOP wiki, which is currently the way how to do this. Or if you are good with XML, you can parse it. The next thing, which is still under development mostly, so there's no URL yet, uh, is, is work done mostly by Amar Amar, who will also present later today, uh, on the Snorkel user interface, where basically the, the Sparkle queries are already preloaded into a UI where you can still adapt these queries and um, reuse basically all the questions that we already put in the GitHub repository that is used to load all these, all these questions. Um, Marvin, uh, still two minutes, two and minutes. then ten o'clock. I have three slides left. I will step. I will skip my my next question. Um, <clears throat> well, maybe I can just. I will open the question, but I will not show it on the screen. Um, so the question is open on on Google. Um, so what makes nanomaterials so tricky for for adverse outcome pathways? Well, as described, AOPs are chains from key of key events from any molecular initiating event to any adverse outcome. So a nanomaterial specific molecular initiating event can still be called uh, a an AOP specific adverse outcome pathway since it's this chain that only starts with this particular molecular initiating event. But they are supposed to be developed chemical agnostic or stressor agnostic being more generic than your general mode of action more wide, widely uh, 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 usable. Also, the uh, uh, physiochemical properties of, of nanomaterials very, very much, even with the same uh, elemental composition, they can be having very, very different effects in the biological system, leading to some um, yeah, problems in reproducibility of the kind of data that is produced or being generated or information that is taken out of it. I have two slides left. Um, so I did a short um, um, exercise looking into the AOP wiki, what is already there in terms of nanomaterial related information. And in terms of stressors, only eight out of the almost 500 stressors are describing nanomaterials or nanomaterial like uh, um, stressors. Of course, this is not done automatically. You cannot read all the 900 of them and I just ex uh, expect that they are nanomaterials. This is just um, because they are not annotated. There is no annotation existing for uh, uh, these kind of nanomaterials, which is, is lacking in this database. Last slide. Um, another exercise looked into all of the AOPs themselves, all of the AOPs, all of the key events and all of the key event relationships. And if any of these have some description of nanomaterials, I would include it in uh, a large data frame, which eventually led to, to this one that you see right here, um, which is, like I mentioned before, I see some fibrosis related pathways, but also some cancer pathways, which I did uh, did see show up in the word cloud before, uh, which is confirming. And then I'm very curious to look at the answers afterwards to, to see what kind of other things that are there. OK, thank you. This was my very rapid presentation. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. It's uh, it's clear that the, the block of 15 minutes is just not enough to, to get really through uh, the key points. Uh, um, I, I, I saw a few questions. One, and, and you answered uh, partly, I think, um, is about uh, does AOP wiki cover uh, chemical biological interactions? Um, well, stressor uh, interactions. Um, yeah. Indeed, there is some chemicals described in there, over 400, I would say, uh, or chemical groups, and how they interact with the biological system. But this is also uh, still an, an issue with the AOP wiki. It's still very much on the development. So most of the adverse outcome pathways that are there do not contain very elaborate information on these interactions themselves. Okay. Yeah, and I'm it's sorry. It's descriptive as well. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to, to, yeah, I have to, to stop it here. Otherwise, there is no time for any break. But I think that Martin uh, still has a, a short announcement because he has something in, in the chat also. 
and he maybe can take over and go to the next uh, session. First of all, thank you very much, Peter, Marvin, Penny and Dario for these really great uh, insights. What we attempt to do today is get an insight into the things, make people know who are the specialists in these fields are and connect people. And we will for sure um, within our activities of the Nano Safety Cluster Working Group A, but as well as uh, from the Nano Commons project, which is a community building project and uh, takes a lot of training initiatives in, in, in these emerging tools and understandings, understandings and concepts of for further training events to get in more detail, to get in more depth. We have next week anyway a training event. Um, the AOP Wiki is not training uh, among these training events next week, next Monday, but we will for sure organize something. There is obviously an interest. We also connect these two molecular initiating events um, so stay tuned to our working group mailing list, subscribe there, and you get all this information in future. Thanks very much to the presenters, and thanks so much, Peter, for um, driving really people uh, being within the time frames, and we have a few minutes rest. So take, uh, move your bones a bit. It's, just, it's a long day. It's going to be a long day. Take some, some zip of fresh air or get your... Give yourself a cool drink, maybe a coffee or something else. Uh, we will continue in a few minutes um, with um, session two. So while we have looked now much, much into hazard assessment, what is emerging here, we are going to look into exposure assessment and exposure determination uh, in the next session. We also want to carry this to life cycle uh, assessment. We want to cover the entire life cycle of materials in future. This is very important for a safe environment. You have seen in my introductory slides, I'm also a member of the Scientists for Future. This is really something that I um, very much uh, con uh, am con convinced about that we need to um, get this really now to the application, all these concepts. So we start in a few minutes. I will just change the slides and uh, invite the new speakers.